females have something to do with who they mate with. And there's been a whole world of primatology studies since then showing what female choice is about. First off, how does female choice occur in a typical tournament species? You got this problem. With primates, for example, you wind up with a pair bond, a consort, with a consortship between a male and an ovulating female. And because it's a tournament species, the male is twice the size or has big, huge canines or whatever stuff he's got there. He is physically able to dominate the female quite readily. You do not see female choice in those cases being exerted by the female beating up on the guy and her getting to go mate with who she's interested in. What you see is much more clever behavior on the part of the female. She will, for example, exhaust the guy. Every time he sits down to feed, the female gets up and starts walking. And he has to jump up and, you know, pile together the picnic and go running after. Every time he tries to take a nap, she goes walking. Or what you find with baboons is the most clever thing that females do is they go walk and lead the male right in front of his worst rival. Or then they'll do it again and again and again and get the guy totally haired out and crazed. And at some point, those two males will have a fight. And what then happens is she runs off to the bushes and has what is technically called a stolen copulation with the guy she's actually interested in. <laughs> so maybe it's not so bad to be a female baboon. So now what this brings us to, insofar as this alternative female strategy is available, we now come to this absolutely critical question, one that has run through the ages, which is what do female baboons want? Who do they want to mate with? And people are not positive, but there's some suggestion in the data. It needs to be replicated more. There's this trend, but there's the suggestion that female baboons like to mate with male baboons who are nice to them. No, are they sure? Are they certain? Have they done their statistics right? Is it big? They go and they mate with guys who groom them a lot. Guys who play with their infants. Guys who, when they're in a bad mood, don't beat up on them, but beat up on somebody else. I mean, this counts as a prince of the male baboon. This is someone you take home to meet mom when he's in a bad mood, he pummels someone else, not me. This is someone you want to mate with. And in the mid-1980s, excellent primatologist Barbara Smuts of University of Michigan came up with the very jargony scientific term that all sorts of non-human primates have intersexual friendships. And that's not an anthropomorphic term. What it was, though, was people sort of snickering at it in that the initial notion was that these were just friends. These were platonic monkey relationships. They were not about reproduction. And it was not until people got good enough and enough data to start picking up on all those stolen copulations to see that the females were picking up and mating with their nice guy. Oh, we're just friends. I can never see him. But whoa, and they're suddenly in the bushes with him. And it suddenly turned from the, yeah, nice guys finish last. OK, they do lots of grooming, but let's count number of copies of genes, to becoming apparent that the being a nice guy was a viable alternative reproductive strategy as long as there was this thing of female choice. And what the paternity studies began to show was that was a very viable alternative strategy, in part because you're not mating anywhere near as much if you were a low-ranking, affiliative male with a female. You're not rating anywhere, mating anywhere near as much as the high-ranking males, but you're not burning out, you're not getting injured, you're not having the male-male fighting, you live a lot longer, and this keeps happening. There's a problem, though, which is, suppose you are a female baboon, and you want to mate with this nice guy, and one of the things that he's nice about is he's nice to your kid, who's now about three, four years old, and there's a very good chance that where that affiliative relationship started with him, got jump-started, was the fact that he was the most likely father of that kid, and has developed somewhat of an affiliated relationship with the kid, and hangs out with them, and hangs out with you, and so you've established this is a nice guy I want to mate with. But there's a problem which was if he was the likely father of your now three, four-year-old offspring, the odds are that three, four years ago, he was a pretty high-ranking male. And what that means now, three, four years later, is he's likely to be some aging guy over the hill whose rank has been dropping. 
In other words, not someone who is going to be very effective at male-male competition. And you get this horrible sort of tension there going on between the male-male competitive world generates some Arnold Schwarzenegger jerk who's the one who's supposed to where she wants to mate with Alan Alda or whoever. And what you have then is he's not up to the male-male competitive stuff because he's some aging guy. And you instead have the world of stolen copulations. So isn't that great? Isn't that heartwarming? A whole world of what are now called alternative strategies. If you're some schemy male baboon wanting to pass on as many copies of your genes, you may decide the really manipulative thing to do is to be nice to some female and groom her more than she grooms you, which is a very rare thing for a male baboon to do. So great alternative strategies, very heartwarming. Not so heartwarming because there are another, other alternative strategies available in some species, alternatives where male sexual behavior is not the outcome of explicit male-male competition, but instead takes an alternative strategy. And you see one example of this in orangutans. Orangutans, great apes, and they've got a very interesting, bizarre social system. But what you have is your basic, nonetheless, sort of familiar picture of male-male competition. Large percentage of orangutan male aggression is built around reproductive access to females. And you've got a whole world of very peripheralized, low-ranking males who never mate. And there's an interesting physiology that goes along with it. That was the picture that everybody used to have. And then in the 1970s, pioneer researcher in this Baruti Galdakas, who has studied orangs for decades out there in Indonesia, uh, she noted something really disturbing, which is low-ranking, non-reproductive male orangs have an alternative mating strategy. What do they do? They rape females. And this was the first introduction of that term into zoology, and that is not an anthropomorphism. If defined as a violent process of mating with a female against her will, this is what goes on in orangutans. A certain percentage of reproduction is low-ranking guys who have no direct access to females as a result of male-male interactions. This is not the nice guy alternative, so there is precedent for this also. And this is by now very well-documented behavior among orangutans. Then, if you want to come up with something very subtle and clever, there's apparently this whole world of fish species where low-ranking males can pretend to be a female and take on female coloration and pretend to be just friends and someone they could pour their heart out to. And then suddenly, one day, they have a penis. And where'd that come <laughs> from? And everything suddenly changes there. OK, 